Hello, welcome to the House of Wellness. I'm Luke Darcy, and I'm thrilled to be here alongside Joe Stanley, Jackie Felgate, and Dr. Nick Carr. Welcome, everyone. Hello. Good to see you, it is so lovely to be here, and it's my favourite time of year. Spring brings with it gorgeous sunny days, beautiful showers sometimes, <laughs> and it's two weeks till the AFL Grand Final. I cannot wait. Joe, it's been one of the best seasons I can remember in a long time. I'll tell you what, I never get sick of, and that is seeing a full house at the magnificent Coliseum, the MCG. We haven't had crowds for a couple of years, so to see it back in a big way is brilliant. Now, Nick, you're into some quirky sports. You play <laughs> royal tennis three times a week. We know you're a great supporter of uh, the international frisbee world. Uh, any football at all? Does that get your attention? Well, I, I grew up in the UK, so I played rugby union, but as you can see, I'm not really quite the body type. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually really wish I'd been here because I love AFL and I think I would have been perfect for that game. <laughs> Another thing you might love is AFLW, Dr Nick. I've been getting right behind it and this year it's shaping up to be a great one for women in sport. Season 7 has been outstanding. You're just seeing every year the girls are getting better and better. It's brilliant to watch. And today we're going to catch up with one of the AFLW's brightest stars. I'm looking forward to that. But first, what's making health headlines with you, Jack? Yeah, plenty does. We start with some great news for young Australians. In a world-first program, Monash University is offering free DNA screening for people aged 18 to 40 to detect their risk of major disease. The free saliva test identifies genes that increase the risk of certain cancers and heart disease. At least 10,000 young people across the country will be screened as part of the free pilot program does. And Nick, this has traditionally been offered to older people thought to be at higher risk. So is this a big deal? Yeah, so we know that about one in 75 Australians actually carry a high risk gene of some kind. And this project's going to test for about 10 of them. Um, and they're going to test for things like cancers, cholesterol, a thing called Lynch syndrome, which is a rare syndrome associated with risks of various cancers, like the gut and the uterus. And this kind of gene testing, I mean, it really is the way of the future. It's hoped that the free DNA screening project will eventually become permanent in a similar way to the free bowel cancer test kits that are sent out to people aged 50 and over. Let's go overseas now, and there's been a major breakthrough in the treatment of blindness. Swedish researchers have used a cornea implant made from pig skin collagen to enable 20 people to see again. Volunteers in India and Iran took part in the trial which implanted them with biosynthetic corneas. It's pretty amazing. It is truly amazing and such a leap forward when you consider that every year more than a million people worldwide lose their vision because of damaged or diseased corneas. It's the gift of sight. And there's an acute shortage of human cornea donors, so this could actually be an easy and sustainable solution to corneal blindness. Phase two of the landmark trial is now underway. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I always seem to come up with my best ideas in the shower. Well, in the shower or cleaning the shower mm. for me. I like that <laughs> manual labour. It just clears my head a little. Bex always yelling at me that I'm talking to myself in the shower. <laughs> and can you get out? Because that, oh, that's my favourite spot. Best ideas come in the shower. I'm usually trying to tell my kids to wrap up their shower. They're in there for turn too long. But it turns out this is actually backed by science. It comes from 15 years of research that found people may be more likely to have creative epiphanies while doing something that doesn't require much thought. Basically, when they're on autopilot, that's when the mind is able to wander, which experts believe helps it tap into and explore new ideas. What do you think, Dr Nick? Well, the neuroscientists put this down to what's called the default mode network. And it's, this is the neurological network that connects more than a dozen regions of the brain. And so when we're concentrating hard on something, it's overridden. But when we relax in the shower, switch off, all those connections fire up and with really creative results. And the dopamine we get from the shower doesn't do any harm either. You know, I think that's where I get my best ideas when I'm out running, because of the dopamine, because I'm not thinking really, and because I'm away from my kid. That helps as well. <laughs> I've got time to myself. <laughs> well, you make a very good point. So when your kids or partner are having an extra long shower, don't get mad. They could be dreaming up the next great Australian novel or maybe some incredibly brilliant solution to a world problem, Dust. We look at Google, they give you a whole day off work just to think about doing your work better. So I think, you know, that's got some merit. It's worked pretty well for them, uh, <laughs> uh, Joe. Thanks, Jay. Up next, uh, Joe, you catch up with one of Australia's favourite entertainers to talk about the condition that affects one in nine Australian women. That's right. Former yellow wiggle Emma Watkins opens up about her struggles with endometriosis when we come back right after this.
common dream for many people is to start a family. But for a large percentage of couples, that dream can be tainted by fertility struggles and unexpected health hiccups that are hard to overcome. One of these is endometriosis. One in nine Australian women suffer from it and the condition is often left misdiagnosed or undiagnosed. That was the case for popular former Yellow Wiggle, now Emma Memmer. Welcome, Emma Watkins. Thank you very much. And welcome to the board director of Endometriosis Australia, whose family has also been touched by the disease. Hi, Marie Davenport. Hi, please be here. Emma, you have shared your experience with endometriosis very publicly. How was the experience for you? I think for me, I didn't realise that I had endometriosis for a very long time. I was touring around the world and was so busy that I didn't understand the kind of pain that I was suffering and so I sadly got onto it way too late, but I think is the most case for everybody. And how are you now? Well, I feel much better now. Fortunately, I've had about five years to rehabilitate my body after a laparoscopy for stage four endometriosis, but I think the year after, I thought I was OK, um, but I actually realise now that I probably wasn't. <laughs> I'm much better now. So can you explain what endometriosis is, Marie? It's the growth of um, uterine tissue or similar to uterine tissue outside of the uterus or the womb. So it's usually in the pelvic cavity area. Um, it can affect the bowel, it can affect other organs as well, but it can actually occur in other parts of the body. I can't even imagine, Emma, as a, an entertainer, where you're performing and the show must go on and you're touring, which can be very gruelling, at the same time managing symptoms that can be very debilitating. I think as women you don't realise that the pain that you're suffering might be similar to others around you. And so for me, I thought that that was a normal level of a period pain, to be honest. And I must have been suffering that through high school because I was really unwell in high school with terrible period pain. Um, but now I know that it wasn't quite that, that it was more associated to endometriosis. I guess for me it got to the point where I was unfortunately bleeding every day. So when it got to that point, I realised that there was something more than just outside of the normal boundaries of pain. I know that it can take, I think, on average six and a half years for endometriosis to be diagnosed. Were you seeking medical help during that time and not getting a response? I was probably um, a bit lazy and not quite aware of my own body suffering through the pain. So for me, it was about... 10 years late, <laughs> um, which is why it got to the point where not just endometriosis, but I also had um, this particular condition that's known as chocolate cysts. And so the blood is stored and then it doesn't have anywhere to go. So it just decides to um, release itself all the time. Marie, is that a common experience for women that they actually don't seek help when perhaps they yeah. need to? And this is why education is so crucial um, for girls and women. Um, and, and the diagnosis period can be as long as um, as 10 years or long, you know, or, or often women in their, you know, 30s are finding out that they have endo. Mm. Uh, so there's education of, of the girls and the mums and the women and there's also education in the health system of, for GPs. Uh, but it, it can be incredibly life-defining um, because what you think is normal, you don't know, um, is, is not the experience that every other girl or woman has and um, you, you, you know you might be told you're, you're overreacting or it's just period pain. It's downplayed uh, and diagnosis is very difficult. So for a young woman, like my daughter started having symptoms when she was 10 and um, initially it was like, well, it can't possibly be that and they're looking at appendicitis and we're like, well, clearly it's not something like that when she's, you know, having a menstrual bleeding at that age. So it, it, despite, you know, my contacts, my advocacy for my daughter, it took a long time. And often the only way to diagnose is through very invasive surgery like laparoscopic uh, procedures. Um, and you don't want to subject a young woman uh, or girl to that sort of invasive operation and the risks associated with that. Um, unnecessarily, but it also costs a lot of money. There's an enormous cost to being well and managing endometriosis. I believe that uh, women who experience endometriosis, it's not just the physical cost, but it actually has an impact, not just emotionally, but even with their careers. It has an enormous impact on women 
in the workforce, um, you know, their reliability. Um, in fact, there are studies um, recently uh, that find that during lockdown and work from home protocols, uh, women's productivity improved so much because they could manage their symptoms at home and they didn't have to take the whole day off. But it costs the economy about $9.7 billion a year in productivity and other costs, and about two and a half million of that is directly attributed to the cost of health care. And I believe, Marie, not all women experience infertility due to endometriosis, but some do. Yes, it, it is a, certainly a, a factor, um, getting pregnant, but also sustaining that pregnancy. Um, in addition to the endometriosis, is another disorder, uh, adenomosis, uh, which, again, it, it, it's within the uterus. So it impacts on uh, the body's ability to sustain a pregnancy and, um, and also, you know, much higher risk of, of pregnancy loss, miscarriage um, and stillbirth after 20 weeks as well. Emma, I understand that you got married earlier this year. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, does this weigh on your mind, your plans for having children? I think constantly. And when I was diagnosed with endometriosis, it, I think I felt the hit then and worrying about the future about if I was in going to attempt to have a baby or even uh, try that fertility route. For me, I'm not quite there yet, um, but I do think about it constantly because it does limit your chances of, of fertility, but at the same time, I guess it's very individual. Um, at the moment, I'm not too worried, but um, you never know what that's going to be until I embark on that journey. And so you've spoken so openly about this. Why did you make that choice? I think for me, I didn't really have an option and we really needed to be quite truthful to the audience because for children and me not being at the show was quite confusing. So I knew that I had to be really upfront about the diagnosis, but also I was also learning about it myself at the time and we wanted to make sure that people knew that that was the reason why I was taking time away from the show, whereas a lot of other people thought that I was leaving because I was pregnant, <laughs> but it was completely the opposite. Yes. And so that time away from work and away from the workforce can also be quite confronting because people think that you're going away to have a baby, mm. <laughs> but it's totally the opposite. It's a huge contrast. Uh, it can be very hurtful, mm. I yeah. imagine. Yeah. yeah. And what has the response been from women who've heard your story? I think at the shows, it's mostly mothers encouraging me to um, continue to have a baby. <laughs> and all, all mothers sharing their story about either themselves or family members. Um, I guess encouraging me and giving me positive uh, outcomes or a journey. They're like, don't give up, keep going, you can have a baby. <laughs> Which is quite lovely because everyone wants to share their story about how they've struggled through it. Most people are very positive and have a lot of hope for the potential of fertility, but um, at the same time, it's nice to be able to connect with women and girls all around the world um, and hear their stories and hear their journey. Marie, you've been an advocate not just as a part of this amazing organisation, but also for your daughter. Mm. What advice have you got for women who might be hearing this and going, oh, I wonder if my mm. symptoms could be endo? Mm. It's so important to go to your GP and if you don't... ..if you feel you're not listened to, go to another GP. Um, I encourage women to go to the website of endometriosisaustralia.org. There are so many resources there and there are also stories from our wonderful ambassadors like Emma who we call them endo warriors because they do so much to um, raise awareness and their own personal journey empowers other women to say okay things are not all right and these are you know these are women that are living with it like me I'm not alone and um, this is their journey and perhaps I need to take greater action. Well, I consider you both warriors. Thank you so much for the work that you are doing for this really critical conversation because it's changing women's lives. Thanks so much, Marie and Emma. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Joe, and the amazing Emma Watkins there. I'm fangirling. My two daughters are fangirling. We loved her as the yellow wiggle. You can get more information and support by checking out the Endometriosis Australia website. Up next, we're talking prescription prices. They'll be going up on October 1. Find out how you can beat the price hike right here on the House of Wellness.
Adelaide Centre here for Adelaide. In swoops Phillips. I found that once I did become vegan and turned to a more plant-based diet that actually started getting the, the best out of my body and being able to do things better than before when I wasn't a vegan. I sleep better, I feel better, I have more energy and my overall just general health and well-being is so much better. For AFLW player Erin Phillips, a plant-based diet hasn't come at the expense of her athletic ability. Whether it's supporting lean muscle growth, muscle recovery or repair, it may be possible without the reliance on traditional protein sources. The key is finding the right teammate. INC's plant range support my diet because they offer really fantastic supplements for plant-based diets. They have protein powder, a lot of different flavours, the crunch bars which are a great little snack to put in your bag and have if you need and also the amino acid blend so they cover all the bases and they're absolutely all delicious. As with any health goal, quality is important. The INC range has a vegan Australian certification plus added trust thanks to the informed sports certification. This means they're free from banned substances. A diet to an elite athlete is incredible. It's actually really important to anybody, really. And for me, it's being able to get the best out of my body. As an athlete, you push yourself to the absolute limit. So diet is incredible. It's the fuel, it's what makes you recover. I love putting the protein powders in my pancakes. So it gives me an extra little protein kick. So you can put them in obviously cereals, smoothies. There is a lot that you can do. And especially as a busy mum like I am, chucking a smoothie and making one really quickly to start your day is um, really convenient. AFLW star Erin Phillips there, who's excelling at her new club, Port Adelaide. Meanwhile, the AFL men's grand final is back at the MCG after a couple of years away. Jo, have you got your ticket? Well, I will do everything I can to get there, Jack, because it is without a doubt one of my favourite days of the year, a packed MCG. I mean, the vibe in that place, is it not one of the greatest moments you could ever experience? The definition of heaven for so many of <laughs> us, I think. Yes. And everyone, though, is feeling the pinch of exploding living costs and days out at the footy or other entertainment, it's often the first thing to go. Well, it's absolutely true, Jack. It's petrol, it's power, it's groceries, mortgages and even prescription medicines. As of October 1st, the price of many everyday medicines from asthma treatments to antibiotics will go up. It's thanks to a deal struck between drug companies and the federal government to overcome drug shortages. Well, the last thing we need is yet another price hike, especially for medicines. But there are ways to get around it. So in a bid to ease the pain of paying too much for your prescriptions, I went straight to the top and asked Chemist Warehouse Director and Pharmacist Mario Tasconi the best ways to grab a bargain. Mario, a lot of people believe that prescription medicines cost the same no matter where we go. Is this the case? Oh, certainly not. I mean, um, prescription prices, like any items of commerce, um, vary in, uh, in price. Customers now shopping around for their prescriptions, they can just look online and you can see the cost of your prescriptions and, and the price savings are dramatic that, you, that can be made just by simply shopping around. So what is the government co-payment? The government co-payment is, is basically the PBS system, so the government sets a safety net limit, so for, for more expensive drugs, the, the government basically guarantees the patient pays no more than $42.50, so any medicine that costs more expensive than that, the government says the patient pays $42.50, the government pays the rest. Now, for a pensioner, that co-payment amount is $6.80. Um, the good thing that uh, the government introduced a few years ago is they allowed pharmacies to discount that co-payment by $1. So, and Chemist Warehouse passes on that dollar, so pensioners pay $5.80 at Chemist Warehouse and general patients for the maximum co-payment prices pay $41.50. We actually did a tally because the government's allowed us to do this dollar discount since 2015 and we've just crossed the $100 million mark of saving $1 discount since that point. We've just reached that amazing milestone. So it's $100 million of savings uh, to pensioners and general patients since that new law rule was introduced. And how does that apply to medications? The big savings are to be had are for the items that fall below the co-payment, and that's where the price competition really hots up. And there's thousands of drugs that fall below $42.50, and that's where significant savings can be made. 
So what kinds of savings are we talking about here? Oh, we're talking huge. And I, I bought some in just to, yes. uh, off the shelf, so <laughs> just to show you. And, you know, if we look at a drug like Nexium for heartburn, you can pay anywhere up to $30 for, for this type of medication for a month's supply. And at Chemist Warehouse, it's only fifteen fifty. So that's a that huge saving. That's huge. Okay. And particularly <laughs> for someone that takes that every month, uh, and over a course of a year, that's like $165 saving uh, over a course of a year. Similar for other blood pressure for this Resuvastatin. Resuvast which is for cholesterol. Um, we, we sell this for $5.99. You're paying anywhere up to about $20 for this product at most other pharmacies. So it does make sense to shop around for these type of medications. And does this apply to drugs prescribed for chronic conditions as opposed to short-term medication? Correct. And, you know, for short-term relief, like an antibiotic, like a simple amoxicillin, I mean, that's only $5.80 at most other pharmacies. That you're paying close to $20. Um, and, and it's a one-off. And even, you know, Ventolin inhalers, on mm -hmm. prescription, you can get two of those for, for $20 at Chemist Warehouse and that's usually about $30 to, 30 to $32 at most other pharmacies. So huge savings, whether it's for a chronic condition or whether it's, you know, just a regular antibiotic. So I've heard there are some changes coming October 1, some price changes. Can you share on that? Yes, uh, and this will affect most of the drugs that fall below forty-two fifty. The government's done a deal with the generic manufacturers, to, and the wholesale price of those drugs are going to rise dramatically uh, come October one, um, which will should in most other pharmacies lead to a substantial increase in cost. But at Chemist Warehouse, we've we've uh, bitten the bullet. We're going to absorb all those costs, so there'll be no changes to our pricing. Our everyday low pricing will continue beyond October one. So no need to panic or panic buy that um, but um, it's really important the health industry plays its part and just to keep the medication profile medications um, uh, as affordable as possible and that's our mission statement is to make sure medicines are affordable for more Aussies. So what is your advice for consumers who are seeking the best possible outcome for their medications? Uh, always go to pharmacists for their advice um, no matter where, where they are um, and then when it comes to, to price uh, and affordability, particularly now more than ever, it's time to shop around. Um, do your research, it can be online or come into store, see the prescription price list and know your pricing uh, because there are huge savings to be made just by simply shopping smarter. I tell you, Jack, I was absolutely stunned by the difference in some of those prices. Yeah, it's phenomenal, isn't it? And it's just like all the basics, bread, milk, petrol. As Mario said, do your due diligence and shop around. Absolutely. I have to say, I recently cleaned out my medicine cabinet, Jack. I, it is the place that time forgot there. <laughs> what I have kept in that cupboard, I don't know why. It does tend to be the drawer that rarely gets cleaned out, doesn't it? And with kids, you do gather a lot of medicines that you don't always finish, so they end up back in the drawer draw here, they go out of date, which you only discover when you desperately need them next time. Absolutely. Well, last financial year, eight of the most used medicines in Australia were for cholesterol and lowering blood pressure, and not surprising as stroke and cardiovascular disease are leading causes of death. Meanwhile, the use of medicines to treat depression and anxiety has actually grown in the wake of the pandemic due to a rise in mental health issues, while the use of antibiotics has declined. Up next, a medicine of a different kind, restoring dignity and confidence to breast cancer survivors. Back after this. Well, it's a month since Australia lost singing superstar Olivia Newton-John, and it's fair to say the whole country and the world have mourned her passing, Jo. Absolutely. The legacy Olivia left is incredible. Grammy Award-winning music, timeless films, and, of course, her tireless work fighting cancer and helping others through her Cancer Wellness and Research Centre. I remember the day she came to Melbourne to open up the wellness centre. I was there and just the aspirations that she had for it and the wonderful work that it's done in raising awareness for breast cancer, it really can't be overstated. Dr Nick, knowing the early warning signs and regular screenings and self-examination really are keys to fighting this devastating disease. A breast screen is one thing that I never miss doing. Yes, but routine mammography is only suitable from the age of about 45 to 50. And so while there's some debate about the value of breast self examination, I actually think it's really important that younger women get to know the look and feel of their own breasts with a monthly check. Well, I'm sure all of us here know someone 
or of someone who's had breast cancer. I know that I have lost a couple of very dear friends to breast cancer. I'm sure that we all relate to that experience. And just devastating because it often strikes women in the prime of their lives. It's one of those appalling things. Someone comes in, you have to tell them the result of that scan. It's awful. It is estimated that around 20,000 new cases of breast cancer will be diagnosed in Australia this year. Women who undergo a life-saving mastectomy are left with more than just physical scars, which is why a unique tattoo service has started up to bring back dignity, femininity and confidence to breast cancer survivors. There's definitely a stigma attached to the tattoo industry. People think that when you have tattoos, you're maybe not educated or you maybe come from a rough um, background, but a lot of people's sons and daughters and aunties and grandmas have tattoos. The tattoo culture has already come a long way from sailors and bikies, but Alicia Gannon has catapulted it into a whole new age. I started Pink Lotus when I was on maternity leave and that's where I tattoo 3D nipples on women post mastectomy from breast cancer. Obviously I gathered the word pink because a lot of breast cancer groups are mainly focused on pink and lotus is planted and grown from the swamp and as this lotus grows through the swamp it grows into this beautiful flower, the lotus flower and so it doesn't matter what turmoils and whatever you're going through in life you can still come out of it and, and grow. So I was diagnosed in early 2019, decided uh, there and then that I had to have a left mastectomy and ended up having to have chemotherapy and radiation as well and then decided to have a right mastectomy as a precautionary thing. And, um, Arwen Griffiths so found herself in the unique position of going from breast cancer nurse to breast cancer patient. Obviously after a double mastectomy I had my nipples removed as well and I was looking in the mirror one day thinking I just don't look whole. Obesity. To any woman who's been through what I've just been through you end up feeling quite butchered and you've got a lot of scars on your body and I just didn't want any, any more scars. So I looked at um, Alicia's website and purchased some of her temporary tattoos. I thought I'll do that first and I was just blown away by them and how whole I felt after that and it just made, that was it, my decision was made that tattooing Alicia's 3D tattoos was the way that I wanted to go. So is everything feeling okay? Feeling good? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The 3D nipple tattooing is permanent, so they last forever. Yeah. Arwen's already had one nipple session with me, and that's my first session where I've, I've laid on the ink just to give it some colour. And usually the second, if needed, a third session is where all the detail gets put into creating the shadow and the Montgomery glands and making sure it's all nice and soft around the edges to mimic a real nipple. We're born with nipples. All animals are born with, unless there's something majorly wrong, but we're all born with nipples. For women, we nurture, you know, the majority of us nurture our babies with them. Um, they can be an erogenous zone for many people as well. And to suddenly not only lose your femininity by losing your breasts, um, you've, you've lost your nipples as well. So it's, it's a double-edged sword of, of feeling that things have just changed dramatically. Lynn Sinclair had both breasts removed in 2017. She was introduced to Alicia through her son, who was already a client. Well, to be honest with you, I mean, when I had them done, I actually got in my car and got my phone and lifted my top and took some photos and sent them to my kids because I was just... I, I just was wrapped. I was just so happy that I'd had this done. My daughter messaged me back and said, what are you doing sending me nude pictures of women? And I said, that's me, that's, that's me. I've just had my tattoo done. And she was just so happy for me. Okay, the size okay? Yeah, but they, if you want to make them a bit bigger. They look real. They look like they've got texture and contour and, and people expect you to turn sideways and that they're going to see a nipple you know, protruding, and it's not, it's, it's completely flat. This is done with a woman who has just got so much compassion and empathy for what people like me are going through.
I knew I needed to finish the journey off and I think what Alicia's done for me is that she's, the journey's now ended, like I can close that chapter. I think it's important for a woman to do this for herself. Still got the scars, of course, from the surgeries as a reminder of my journey, but um, I feel normal. I love it. I love talking with my ladies. They're, they're brilliant and they're strong and they give me so much confidence in myself by the, by the power and the confidence that they have. To give them the nipples back is it's incredible. That's awesome. You know, a lot of us tend to choose these big, massive goals where it's like, hey, I want to lose 20 kilos. And, and that, for me, that's a big no-no. My advice would be focusing on the balance approach. You know, we talk about the training aspect. We talk about sleep. One of my favorite as well is the positive mindset towards any goal that you have as well. And don't forget nutrition. When it comes to achieving fitness goals, fat intake is not the enemy. It's just about choosing the right kind. Medium chain triglycerides, or MCTs, are unique superfats that convert directly to energy rather than being stored in the body. It's a natural, sustainable fuel option. You know, we talk about Melrose, they pride themselves on quality. You know, they got three amazing products which are organic, palm oil free, and just the differences, like, you know, it works well with a ketogenic diet. There's one that increases your energy and cognition. The way I include it is, um, you know, I wake up in the morning, one tablespoon which fuels my day, fuels weight loss, fat loss, and it, you know, it gives me that balance throughout my day. My go-to is actually the MCT Melrose Kickstart. You know, it works really well with my lifestyle. You know, I'm, a, I'm on a ketogenic diet right now as well, so it, it works perfect for that because as soon as I have it in the morning, you can really feel that instant energy, you know, and I get that automatically fat burning. You feel the energy boost and, you know, it really fuels my workouts. And while not everyone can have a personal trainer like Jono, thanks to the support of MCTs, no one has to miss out on feeling good and striving for their best when it comes to health. Fitness trainer John Castano there who counts actor Rebel Wilson among the many celebrity clients he's helped whip into shape. Rebel's recent transformation has inspired a lot of people to get into their own health uh, routine as well, Jack. Exactly. Someone like Rebel, who's always been so honest and open about herself, is a great motivator when it comes to health and fitness. And there are so many females like her. We saw Erin Phillips earlier, who's inspiring a generation of girls to strap on the boots and get active. She really is incredible. She sure is. And so too is fellow AFLW star Chloe Dalton. Chloe is extraordinary. She's an absolute all-rounder. An overachiever, she's played at the top level of Aussie <laughs> rules, basketball and rugby sevens as well. In fact, she went, was part of the rugby team that won Olympic gold in Rio. What a star. Yeah, if you don't mind, Chloe's sporting journey was sparked by seeing her own idol shine at the Sydney Olympics. Now the GWS giant star midfielder is on a mission to even the playing field for all athletes. Sport has taught me a lot about dealing with people. I think it's really interesting, particularly playing a team sport. You get thrown into this environment with a whole range of different personalities and you have to find a way to come together and make it work. And I think it's been a really unique experience to realise that when you do all have the same focus, you can disagree with people, you can not get along with people, you can have completely different personalities, but you can come together and work towards the same goal and be really effective in the way that you go about that. I played a lot of different sports as a kid, but when I got into high school, basketball was probably my main sport. And so to have the chance to play in the WNBL with the Sydney Uni Flames was massive. It was kind of like I ticked off this, this big box of, of wanting to get one step closer to my dream of, of representing Australia. And then when I got there, it probably wasn't as exciting as what I thought it was going to be. Not exciting, I, I loved the experience, but I didn't get a lot of court time when I was at the Flames. I, I spent about two years sitting on the bench and so it kind of, brought me back down to earth a little bit and I had to realise how hard it was to get to the top. So I went 
um, onto Google. I went home and I typed into Google list of Olympic sports. And then I saw that Rugby Sevens was going to be in the Olympics for the very first time in Rio in 2016. And I'd grown up in a rugby family. I used to go down to my local footy field down at Rat Park and watch my brothers play on the hill. So I had an understanding of it, but, but actually learning how to tackle and, and learning how to form a ruck were such foreign ideas. And to be a part of a group like that, that was so dedicated and so committed to achieving this dream of winning an Olympic gold medal is, is something I don't think I'll ever experience again in my life. When I first got to Carlton, I didn't know a lot about Aussie rules about the game. I'd, I'd grown up in Sydney, so I didn't really know the rules or have a great understanding of how to play. So I was running around like a bit of a headless chook, I think, for a while there. Shooting for goal herself, but setting up opportunities. Dalton was strong in the contest, controlled it at ground level. Over time, I've, I've come to appreciate why so many people are obsessed with this game, because I absolutely love it. It's, it's something I wish I, I started from when I was younger. It's so much fun. I think it's an incredible combination of skills, and I think for me, I've been able to bring different things that I've learned from basketball and from rugby and, and present, I guess, a unique approach to the game as well. Not your traditional footy player in a sense. And, and I think the more I learn and the more I play, I'll move more into that space. But I've quite enjoyed being a, a cross coder who brings something a little bit different. This is O'Dwyer. She's going to try and get away from Dalton and not many do that. Four weeks out from Tokyo Olympics, we were playing up in Townsville and my teammate and I came from opposite directions and tried to tackle the same person and the top of her head went into my cheekbone. I think I fractured it in about four places and had to go in and have surgery to have three plates put into my face. And so I was stuck in a hospital room for about five or six days and, and got delivered the news that I was going to be missing the Olympics. And it was just devastating. I'll, I'll, I'll never forget that conversation when, when the head coach, John Menenti, came to visit and, and tell me the news. And I think it just was tough. I had to come back into another lockdown and sit on the couch and, and watch my teammates compete over in Tokyo. Um, it was a really, really tough thing to have to process. One really positive thing that came out of it was because of the work I'm doing with the Female Athlete Project is I got to actually devote all of my time to trying to shine a light on the incredible athletes that were over there and the incredible female athletes that were competing in the Olympics and the Paralympics too. I had this passion about gender equality. As, as a female athlete, I've experienced a whole range of different inequalities across my life. And I always knew I wanted to do something in the space and I wanted people to listen to me, but I didn't know how to do it. And and I've got two incredible brothers who have always encouraged me in what I want to do. And, and they kind of just said to me, you've just got to do it. you just got to start something. So I originally started it as a podcast where I wanted to interview other female athletes and to hear their stories and to share their stories. I think the storytelling element of it is really powerful for people to see these athletes, but also to know what they've been through. And so, We've kind of grown it into more than just a podcast and particularly in the social media space where trying to give people really easy access to information about the incredible things that female athletes are achieving on a daily basis. Smith, good pick up on her boot laces and Dalton. Seen her Jets decides to put them on one bounce. That's the second. I've had the opportunity to be a full-time athlete with Rugby Sevens and I've now gone back to being a part-time athlete with AFLW. So I've seen the results that you can get when you're a full-time athlete and, and you have the ability to devote all of your time to your craft. That's a huge piece and I think on the back of that, if there's a visibility element, more media coverage, that then translates at a grassroots level to more girls and, and young boys seeing it and wanting to get involved and playing sport. And I think that then ensures the sustainability of the competitions for years to come. There is West again. Well done, Chloe Dalton. Well, she does that for a living, nails, tackles. It's an observation without notice, but I get the feeling we're all pretty good friends here on the House of Wellness. Would you agree? Yeah. Yes. I mean, now's the time to bring that up. <laughs> but, yeah. It's not a loaded uh, question, but here's a bit of a heads up. It could be because of the way that we smell. Wow. 
Well, we worked together a long time. We <laughs> knew yeah. to each other, and I think we smell pretty good. We smell great. <laughs> yeah, I'm liking it. Well, and you know what, Das? The saying that people who click right away share chemistry could literally be true. Because according to a study carried out in Israel, it found people with similar body odours are more likely to hit it off as friends. And the researchers found that humans subconsciously seek out others who smell like themselves as a measure of compatibility. And they conducted tests on clean cotton T-shirts given to participants and discovered that those who clicked straight away shared more closely matched odours. We cover the weirdest stories here, but I guess it does make sense. Sorry. Uh, but other human mammals, such as dogs, use their noses to sniff out who's a friend or foe. So chances are we're doing it too without even realising it. Does that mean that when we meet each other, we should give each other a little sniff? <laughs> just to really... We didn't do that in the audition process, <laughs> did we? No. <laughs> Speaking of dogs, which we always like to do, this snippet is guaranteed to make you and your pampered pooch cry tears of joy after noticing a mother dog had tears in her eyes while nursing her puppies. A team of researchers in Japan decided to investigate whether it was associated with happiness and the answer was a resounding yes. <laughs> the researchers measured the volume of tears of a team of four-legged recruits before and after reuniting with their favourite human. The waterworks flooded in for Fido when reuniting with a loved one, but not when meeting a stranger. Has that ever happened to you, Dr Nick? Well, I think the only tears in my household is when my wife comes home and finds that I've allowed the dogs up on the couch. So <laughs> you allow the dogs on the couch, do you? Shh, yeah, don't tell I, I wouldn't have tipped that. Anyway, that's it for today. Thanks to everyone for watching. You can hear more House of Wellness on the radio show with me and Gerald Quigley on Sunday. And go to the House of Wellness website for more great info from the whole team. Look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks, as always, to our great friends at Chemist Warehouse. It's bye for now.